of them. So um, we're going to start from Ayah 183 and sort of buckle up. Where Allah says, Ya yeah, Yunadi We've spoken at length about that, and that's about how Allah has made it or has made fasting upon us mandatory as He has made it mandatory for the people uh, or for the nations, the people before us. Um, and that the purpose of this whole Ramadan is that we can gain, that we should gain taqwa. And that you should already know by now that the meaning of taqwa is to protect yourself from the anger of Allah. How do you protect yourself from the anger of Allah? Anybody have a, a guess, a clue? So I don't just talk the whole time. Go ahead, brother. Do good deeds and avoid bad deeds. There you go, it's very simple. Do what Allah asks and avoid what He's prohib prohibited. Um, if you do that, then you won't gain Allah's anger. And if you're not making Allah angry, you're obviously making Him the opposite of anger is... It's not a trick question, sisters. <laughs> Happy. So, uh, the point here is how do we please Allah? So, really, and although we're going to get into the actual aspects of fasting, the reality is that this fasting is more symbolic than it is real, in the sense that the objective of it isn't, as we mentioned many times, some, sometimes overemphasize the health benefits of fasting when it's a benefit, but it's not the objective of fasting. And so the objective of fasting is to look at how we are able to control our desires, our desire to eat and drink and to be uh, intimate in certain instances, and restrain ourselves in order to say, or in order for the sake of pleasing Allah. And so we should have that same mentality when we're doing anything in our life, because if we're able to do it for a period of time, then that means that with training we can do it all the time. Um, so Allah says that ayam and ma'dudat. Um, these are only a few days. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَةٌ مِنْ أَيَامٍ أُخَرٍ that, so whoever amongst you is sick or is traveling, then they can make them up in an, at another time. So the first point that in order to discuss or that I wanted to discuss is that what is considered a legitimate excuse or what type of sickness would a person be excused from fasting from? Uh, and so obviously, you know, you can kind of um, categorize being sick into two categories. Two categories. One is being termini, terminally uh, ill, where they have a sickness, uh, may Allah protect us, such as cancer or diabetes, where it's permanently with them, it's not temporary. And then you have other sicknesses that are just the common cold, the flu, certain sicknesses they may have or injuries a person may have, in which that you know that after a period of time they're going to go away. So obviously, for a person who has some type of sickness that prevents them from fasting, then they don't have to fast any days of the month of Ramadan, especially if a doctor has said that fasting would cause more harm to their body. So that's very clear. Um, at, set, at the set, uh, same time, for a person who got uh, the flu or got some type of sickness, they became sick, became injured, and now uh, because of it they have to take a certain type of medicine, or uh, for whatever reason they can't fast for a number of days, then uh, they're also exempt for the period in which they're sick. And that means that they're not obligated to fast. And even if, if fasting would harm them, then it would even be haram for them to fast. If by fasting they would cause more harm to their bodies, then they shouldn't force themselves to fast. Because Allah doesn't want you, as the Prophet said, لا ضرر ولا ضرر, that you should not harm yourself or cause harm to others. So the, first, the, the most important thing is that a person is healthy enough to fast, they should do so, and that if they're not, they are supposed to make... So the point is, a person who has, for example, diabetes and they can't fast, they don't have to make up those days um, in another time, they're just obligated to pay a fidya, as we'll see. What is a fidya, or kind of like a consequence, or a penalty um, for not being able to fast? A person who is able to fast, like for example, someone became sick and they can't fast for a day or two because of that sickness or they have to take a, medi take a type of medicine. So they're obligated to fast any time up until the next Ramadan. The other people that may come fall into this category are um, 
women or women who have just given birth, women who are on their monthly cycle or women who have just given birth, they are not, um, they're also prevented from fasting and they're not allowed to fast. It is haram for a woman of these two types to fast and that she has the, until Ramadan is over, I mean, until the next Ramadan to make up those days of fasting. Um, also, a woman who is pregnant or uh, breastfeeding is also ex allowed, depending on um, how she feels, whether or not she, she feels strong enough to fast, then she can do so. If she doesn't, then she's allowed to make up those days later. And just if you're wondering, um, there was a, I found online, I didn't actually bring it with me, but there was a research done in, in the UK with women who were fasting and pregnant. And they found that it didn't cause any real harm to their um, the, their baby or themselves by fasting. So, um, you know, it, I mean, everyone knows themselves better. Everyone, every, every person's situation is different. Uh, obviously, you would talk to your doctor first before you would decide to fast. But the point is that um, there's a, a little bit of evidence or modern research to say that it, it may not, it, it won't harm you terribly. And just for the sake of, I guess, our information, that in general in the UK they have long days of fasting. It's very known that in the U, in, in Europe, or especially in Britain, um, that they have a lot. Even like now, their days are much longer. For example, I think their fajr is two or three a.m. and their maghrib is. I think nine, you know, ten, something, something uh, very extreme compared to us, and this is something that's not uncommon in the UK. You know, even talking to some of uh, some relative, uh, friends I had when I was in the university, that it was always an issue for them with with fasting because they were always known to have long days. So the point is, when Allah talks about what is the ruling for a sick person, then there are basically those types of uh, of categories of sick people. And just kind of for the sake of uh, lumping them in one big group, we I included women who are pregnant or, or, or breastfeeding or on their cycle. So then Allah says, O ala seferin. So here we have an issue, which is traveling. And that issue is, are you obligated not to travel in the month of Ramadan? Or are you obligated to fast while you're traveling in the month of Ramadan? what is the best uh, solution or the best choice and the, 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 most of the scholars say that the best thing for a person to do that fast, I mean traveling is, doesn't affect you know, it, it's, it's everyone's individual choice whether they want to fast while they're traveling, I mean whether they want to travel or not travel in Ramadan there's nothing to say that it's better to travel or, less, or it's not good to travel in Ramadan it doesn't have any bearing on your, on your fasting the only thing, the only time it may be prohibited, obviously, is if the, the purpose of your travel is prohibited or the place you're going is prohibited, or if a person in this, you know, may be very rare, but there's some people, I've actually met people like this, who try to travel in order to uh, um, get out of certain uh, conditions. Like, uh, for example, they, uh, Juma, right? Juma is not mandatory if you're traveling. So they may decide to go travel on Juma in order to get out of that that ruling. So in order, if you use a person uses traveling as a way to get out of Ramadan or get out of fasting, that may be prohibited. But the, if you have a legitimate reason to travel, whether it's for fun or for a business or for whatever reason, then there's nothing, no harm in traveling. So the issue comes. Okay, so what happens if um, you basically have two scenarios? What do you do if you start fasting and then decide that your, your flight, your, the time you want to leave is in the middle of Ramadan, I mean in the middle of the day, as we'll talk about the time, I mean I'm sure most of you know when to fast. So what do you do? It's like uh, you have a flight, let's say you're traveling an international flight, and it's at 2 o'clock. Do you continue fasting? or? Are you obligate? Are you allowed to break your fast, or do you have to continue fasting? What say you, oh people of ICCL? Yes, ma'am, sister. I didn't hear you. 
All right, good. So the point here is that if you are going to travel in the middle of the day, once you actually travel, meaning you are outside the boundaries of your city, then you can break your fast. It doesn't mean that, okay, I'm going to travel today at 1 o'clock, I'm not going to fast today. You have to actually continue fasting until you actually reach outside of your locality. So, for example, for me, I would always wait till I get on the highway. If I'm going to travel by car, obviously, uh, yeah. So if I'm going to travel, let's say to New York, then once I get on 83, I guess, or maybe a couple miles on 83, I would consider myself outside of my the city that I live in, and then one could say, I mean, if, if, for me, that's what I could, it's kind of difficult, but if you know the boundaries of your city very well, then as soon as you exit the boundaries of your city, then you're allowed to break your fast. Okay. Now, the dilemma comes for, this is kind of, I don't want to spend too much time on small issues. Yes, sir. You're allowed to break your fast, but if you choose to continue fasting, you can't, right? Okay, good. I was going to get to that. but So, the point, the brother's asking, so what happens if you decide to continue fasting? And both are um, permissible. If you decided that, uh, especially if you... For example, if you go to New York, the, 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 the time of fasting is relatively the same, so there's not much of an issue of breaking it earlier or later. Uh, that's another big issue, but um, especially like if you're on a plane and you're going from time zone to time zone where you may, in the course of your flight, may go be going through two different, three different, four different um, time zones. But if you're going someplace and it's very simple, then yeah, um, it's basically the scholars say whichever is easy for you is the better option. If it's easier for you, if you find no difficulty in continuing to fast, then it's better for you to fast and not break it. But if you find it difficult for whatever reason, there's a, you know, as, as the Prophet ﷺ said, that uh, traveling is a portion of the of punishment uh, because of the hardship it, it takes in order to travel, then uh, it's better for you to travel. There's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ, um, or uh, some of the companions they were fasting, and then some of them, when they reached their destination, had found that some of them had been fasting, and some of them had broken their fast. So it's understood that the companions knew that you have the option of whether or not you want to fast, if you can, or if you feel that there's no stress on you, and you have the option also to, to um, uh, break it. It's, a, it's, it's somewhat of a big issue, in a sense, because some of the scholars say that any time Allah has given you a, uh, an exemption, that you should take it. That Allah loves whenever you take some, some type of rukhsa, some type of uh, exemption that He's given you. So by saying, so, so that's why the issue is kind of, uh, they always talk about it when it comes to fasting, because they say that if Allah is allowing you to break your fast while you're traveling, then you should break your fast. But the reality from the actions of the companions is that whenever they were fasting, if it was hard, they would, and if it wasn't, they wouldn't. So a person is, is, has the choice. Um, so obviously you just have to make up that day, even if you fasted uh, and you broke it in the middle of the day, um, you would have to make that day up. So when it comes to, that's the, the issue of traveling. So you always have to wait until you actually leave the borders of your city. Can I ask one more question along those lines? Sure. You know, some families that take Ramadan off their work schedule, so they can spend Ramadan. And I know some people have other, they, they believe like Ramadan is in longer months of the year. They take it off and they travel to the home country where Ramadan is short, but the fasting is shorter. Yeah. How is that, how is that beautiful? I mean, there's no issue. I mean, they're still fasting. So if they have, uh, you know. The intention is I'll go there because Ramadan is shorter. Is that, is that good? I mean, not everybody has that privilege of being able to, either they don't have the financial privilege or they don't have the, the time off from their job to do so. But um, uh, as far as I, and I'm not a scholar, but as far as I can see, there's nothing that, that uh, would, would uh, be you know, objectionable to that concept. Uh, his question was, uh, the brother's question was that what happens if some people, whenever the month of Ramadan comes, they go back to their native country where the days are shorter. And so is there a problem with going, traveling to your country 
in order to kind of get a less difficult um, Ramadan experience. So, I mean, the objective is that they're meeting all the requirements. They're fasting from Fajr until Maghrib. You know, they're not doing anything outside of what Allah has required them to, uh, to do. And they found, um, if you want to call it a loophole, uh, um, uh, in order to do it. And I mean, it all depends. Uh, there is two, you know, that is kind of like a uh, two sides because if they're going back to an Islamic country, okay, fine, they've escaped maybe an extra two or three hours, but at the same time, they've gained the whole Islamic experience that you can't get here. You know, uh, alhamdulillah, being able to see Ramadan in a Muslim country or in several Muslim countries, there's nothing, it, America doesn't compare. I mean, even certain areas of America where there's a lot of Muslims, the vibe that you get of being in a Muslim country during Ramadan, it, there's nothing in America that I can see is comparative to it. So, you have a whole society now that's fasting, you know, everywhere. So, definitely, um, I don't see anything wrong with, with a person doing that and it may even be better. And I'm sure a lot of people would would choose that over over here. Because honestly, and that's a whole another issue, I don't, I don't want to talk about that one. But there you know, a lot of scholars discuss that being in the in the, in, in non Muslim lands or areas have conditions. To stay here in a non Muslim land there are conditions to doing that. So if you compare what you might get in a, in a Muslim country versus what you might get, maybe if you're giving da'wah in Ramadan in a very active way, or you're, you know, there are very few scenarios in which I think, Wallahu alam, a person could get more edge of being here than, than in, a, in, a, in a Muslim country. Wallahu alam. Um, so then Allah says, uh, So, what happens if you are someone or if a person is sick and they can't make Ramadan up? Uh, this, it says fidya, which is a penalty of uh, feeding a fasting per I mean, a poor person. And so, in the very early stages of Islam, when fasting was obligated, I mean, was, there was an option of to, to fast, then Allah allowed anyone who was excuse me, that anyone who was able to feed one person, one poor person, um, they could do so and not have to fast. After Allah says, uh, which is in the next ayah, that whoever sees uh, the month then they should fast, then they should fast, then that was, um, uh, nullified. So, the point is, if a person is too sick to fast, then they have to feed one uh, uh, poor person one meal. The point that's just something that's food for thought, I guess you could call it, is that the point here is that you can tell that by Allah obligating a person that the, the consequence of not being able to fast or if you're too old to fast, for example, if someone has a type of sickness where they're, obviously someone's too old or someone's too physically unfit to fast, that the consequence was to feed one poor person one meal. It leads us to see that it was commonplace or even in, the, in how Allah has mandated the Sharia that it kind of shows us that the meal or the diet was that one meal is enough for a person in a day. Because the whole point of fat or feeding this person was to make them or give them a meal that they would have had in their day. And so if Allah is only commanding us to do feed that person one time, uh, it shows us that this is kind of like the type of habit or a style, and I'm not uh, going to get into the health issues, but it shows us just the concept of how we may compare our lifestyle versus what, uh, um, you know, like maybe many people may look at our lifestyle as extravagant, to say that we eat three meals a day or God knows how many snacks. So uh, it, it's just something kind of like food for thought to see how Allah is saying that the minimum a person should have is at least one meal a day. And that this meal doesn't have to be extravagant. So it could be something, you know, a very simple meal, something that is common to that locality. Um, and this is only for which type of people? Who are, who are allowed 
to feed one person for one meal uh, if they can't fast? What kind of illness? Chronic illness. Chronic illness. There you go. I said terminal, right? Uh, chronic illness. Someone who has some type of problem that is not going to go away. For example, an old person who's so old that they can't fast in the, they can't fast ever. Or a person who has some type of sickness, cancer, diabetes, may Allah protect us from those type of illnesses that they can't fast. So the thing you're supposed to give them is one meal for one day, for every day that you can't or that person can't fast. Otherwise you have to make it up. Yes? What do you mean gets better? If there's a reversible illness, someone gets ill. Or like a pregnant woman or a nursing mother. Right. Do they take it up and then make it up? Please? No, 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 they don't. As long as they feel, uh, if they feel they're not going to be able to fast, uh, meaning for, like the point of the, the illness, that this is only accepted for people who are sick uh, with a chronic illness or who are old, is because it is understood that those type of people will never be able to fast. So if they are never able to fast, then they pay a fidya. If, for example, they have a sickness in which they're going to be sick and they think this sickness may only be for a few years or a few months, then if they think that it's going to be able to, to be before the next Ramadan, then they could wait until the next book of the prayer. Yeah, yeah, right, that's right. That's right. If a person is unsure, they have a sickness in which they're not sure if they'll ever recover, then obviously the best thing is to pay the fee. Yeah, and if they were to ever recover, they wouldn't have to make up those days of fasting. Because they've already done it, and because they weren't sure if they were. So that's not uh, an issue. I guess you're also in something that we probably take for granted, but something that people explain, is that uh, the fidya is, it is allowed to be money. It is allowed to be money. Even though, cause, because here the ayah says, ta'amu miskin, it says food. But money is allowed, so just in case. And it doesn't have to be from, as we'll get into things like that, it doesn't have to be, it's best to be from your locality, but it is permissible for it to be, um, for example, if you want to send it overseas or to a, a service that's going to be done overseas, or even, for example, you know of people in Lancaster, but you decide to help people in Harrisburg, or you decide to help people in California, or whatever, uh, it's also permissible, but as we'll talk later, that the best is to give the, the this um, penalty or any type of zakat is to um, the people who are close, like to your locality first before others. All right. Then Allah says um, again. Allah repeats these ayat, and so Allah says that the reason why. Uh, he has made or given us the opportunity to make them up if we're sick or traveling is that uh, That um, he wants ease for us and not difficulty and that we can complete these days and that we can glorify or uh, um, you know, um, say the takbir to Allah that, that He has guided us and that we may be grateful for what He has guided us to. And so if once, and this is kind of leading into the idea of Eid and that how we are happy when it's time to break the fast, but the point is that this whole issue of fasting is to get closer to Him and that as we get closer to Allah, we should be more grateful to what uh, Allah has done for us. Now, in order, there's a very, very big issue that, that um, the first, or the, before we can get into Ramadan, we have to know how do you determine when the Ramadan is, and 
we always, especially here in America, I think, and it's become an international uh, issue uh, with the Muslims, is how do you determine Ramadan? Are you going to determine it through calculations or through the moon sighting? And uh, before that, there's something called that it is haram to fast a yam shak the days of, uh, of doubt, meaning that it is haram for a person to fast the last day of Sha'ban, uh, um, or the last maybe two days of Sha'ban, because, does anybody, it's not that difficult to see why, does anybody have an idea why it might be haram to fast during those days? If you think too hard, you won't get it. Yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. Ramadan enters, and it might confuse with you know, 30 days of Ramadan. Not, yeah, exactly. Not necessarily confused, but it may like you may add an extra day to Ramadan. So instead of you fasting the month of Ramadan alone, you've added a day or two. And it's just for the same reason, inshallah, we'll talk why the Prophet forbade a person from uh, continuously fasting without breaking their fast. Like um, fasting two days or more without eating. Because you are doing something, you're like, when you start jumbling up days, it, you, you miss the, the point or you, you um, put an extra burden on yourself that's unnecessary. And so it's not permissible. The only time it, it might be permissible is if someone is trying to make up a, a day that they've missed, a meaning a day of Ramadan of last year that they're missing, that they're trying to make up, and that's the reason why they may be allowed to do so. But even because Aisha radiallahu anha, because of what she saw from the Prophet as he used to make, um, he used to fast so much in the month of Sha'ban that she used to delay her, uh, her, um, her making up, her fasting um, until the month of Sha'ban. So if a person does that, then, and they see that, okay, well now there's only a day left or there might be two days left, that it's permissible for that person because of the fact that um, uh, they have to make up the days of Ramadan. That's wajib over something that's something that someone doing nothing. It's kind of like a person who misses, uh, um, who oversleeps Asr prayer, and they end up praying it in a time where it's a waqt nahi where it's a forbidden time to pray. That even though it's a forbidden time to pray because you have to make up a salah, then it is uh, obligatory for a person to pray. So it's a similar, a similar um, issue. So, the biggest debate here is how do you see it? Through calculations or through the moon sighting? And I think, although, because you know, if you were to go on YouTube or look at, there are books dedicated to this topic. So instead of getting into a long, drawn out debate of what is the better choice or what is permissible, I'll just go with what's more clear or clearer and what is, um, because as a ruling, in a principle, in, in when you look at any religious issue, and this is something that you should very, you know, pay close, pay close attention to, that in Islam, the scholars have made a principle that any time you have two possible opinions in any issue, you should take the safer of those two opinions, regardless of which one you believe in, meaning the most that will save you from the, any type of fear of punishment, you should always take the safer of those two. I'll take one for example, right? There is a debate on whether or not it's permissible to pray uh, uh, during the, the, time, the prohibited times a, a particular prayer or a specific prayer. So let's say that it's a prohibited time after Asr, for example, and a person wants to come, they come into the masjid and they want to pray to the masjid. Is it permissible for them to pray the Tahit al Masjid or is it impermissible because it's a prohibited time to pray? The safest of the two opinions, regardless of whether or not you believe it's uh, um, right or wrong or permissible or impermissible, the safest one is to not pray. Because here it's a nafil, uh, meaning it's something extra, and then there's a prohibited time. So it's a principle in which uh, uh, that it should always protect us. For example, another big idea that there are some scholars who say that gelatin uh, doesn't matter. Eating gelatin is not haram because when you break down gelatin chemically it no longer becomes pork or it's no longer whatever byproduct it is. 
and that uh, there, are, there are people who say that gelatin, and I, I even know, uh, I think, uh, as far as I know, like someone like uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Yasser Qali, I think is the most prominent that I know who's alive, saying that I think he has a degree in chemical engineering. Uh, but there are others who say no, that, 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 that doesn't hold true, that when you, it's still pork or it was pork, so therefore, my point is that as a precaution, that it is safer for us to avoid gelatin rather than eat it, even though your opinion, you may feel that, okay, you may see that this evidence of one person or one scholar is legitimate, it's strong or it makes sense, but the safest of the two opinions is the better opinion. So, um, all of that is talking about the moon sighting and that what is clear that the Prophet ﷺ said uh, that to that uh, fast when you see the moon and to break your fast when you see the moon meaning that we begin Ramadan through uh, an official visual moon sighting and we end Ramadan through an official moon sighting and so a calculation is just that a calculation and that whether or not it's accurate or inaccurate or legitimate or illegitimate, that the safest is to go with where we can physically see the moon. That's the safest of the two opinions. And it's the closest to what the Prophet ﷺ did. They didn't go by calculations, although it was possible. And uh, um, that it's safer for us to begin and end Ramadan as the way the Prophet ﷺ did by looking at the, uh, the moon ourselves. The other issue when it comes to the moon sighting is are we going to go for a local moon sighting or a global moon sighting? And but again, both evident there's evidence that that show that there's clear evidence that the Prophet, for example, there was a man who came uh, uh, from Sham. And Sham is the area of what is now um, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine. And they had seen the moon. As he says in the hadith, he saw it on a Friday. And when he arrived in Medina, he found that the people were still fasting. And he asked one of the companions, you know, uh, why are you still fasting? And he said that we didn't see the moon until Saturday. And so he said, well, we, you know, we saw it on, on Friday. We saw it the day before you, so you should stop fasting. He said, no, we're going to continue or we're going to continue fasting as we have seen it. So there is where he didn't take, he didn't accept this companion, didn't accept a global uh, or someone else's moon sighting as his own uh, uh, moon sighting. And there's another hadith in which the Prophet said that whoever sees, that when a person sees the moon, then they should fast. So from that general hadith, many of the scholars say that, you know, anywhere in the world that announces that it's Ramadan, we should fast. So what should we do here? Well, I mean, the administration has their own way of d uh, looking at it, but for an individual in, for example, ICCO, it would be the better opinion to go with whatever the, the administration of the masjid chooses. If they're going to go with a local moon sighting, then everyone should go with a local moon sighting. If they're going to go with a global moon sighting, then everyone should go with a global moon sighting. It shouldn't be where... You know, we have some of the people saying, well, in my country, we saw, we, we, they saw the moon, so we're going to fast. And then, you know, the rest of America or the rest of the people in the masjid are fasting on another day. That the, the point and one of the principles of the religion is unity. And so even if you look at it, some of the scholars even talk about how important unity is in Islam. Is that even in the salah, when the imam makes a mistake, if he passes certain stages, for example, if he was supposed to sit down in the tashahud and he didn't and he got up, we're supposed to get up with him, even though he made a mistake. So the point here is that we're supposed to do things as one. Now I'm not talking about blatant, you know, blind, uh, having, being blind followers, but the point here is that in certain issues where there's a lot of differences, of, not only of opinion, but difference of circumstance, that we should look to what will unite the community and not do things that will cause more disunity. So, to reiterate, the best solution that we should take in any masjid or as a member of any masjid is to follow whatever the administration of that masjid follows. And if, as far as America, 
you know, when we have, I think, organizations like, I think, ISNA or ICNA, where there are large groups of Muslims who everyone will follow, then we should follow those organizations and how they um, deter not determine the moon, but as to, in order to have more of a unified fast. Just like, you know, and many times we have, because of everybody taking a different opinion on how they're going to determine the sighting of the moon, it's, it, you know, Eid becomes difficult how we're going to pray Eid and which day we're going to pray Eid and it becomes very, very, you know, um, an issue. At the same time, I don't think that we should, and there's another point that it comes to, we should also, you know, stick to stick to the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if, you know, sometimes I've seen people who disagree with moon sightings or they, ju not disagree, they justify moon sightings because they say, well, you know, uh, we can't plan a year in advance, and uh, um, you know, when we have the moon, when we have the calculations, we can determine exactly what day Ramadan is going to be, what exactly what day the Eid is going to be, and it's more like how is it going to look at, you know, the, the how are the non-Muslims going to look at how every year we have to be uh, in limbo of which day we're going to fa begin our fast and which day we're going to end our fast. And we should never allow our decisions to be made simply because of how other people are going to look at us. Whatever we do, the non-Muslims are going to look at us with a, you know, look at us weird, and that everything we do is going to be strange to them, and that that should never be the sole reason why we make a decision simply because we're afraid. And what I mean by that is doing something uh, Islamically or religiously related, and the sole purpose of that is just because of how people are going to look at us. That in Islam we follow the text, we follow what we've been instructed through the Quran and the Sunnah, and even if people will, you know, they won't like it, they don't accept it, we should never care about what they think, because our objective is to please Allah. How can we talk about the month of Ramadan and getting closer to Allah, and behind our decisions are we're looking at how other people are going to perceive what we're doing. So. Um, the issue here is that in order to cite Ramadan, it should be through a, a, a clear moon sighting by uh, one witness in one hadith or two in another. So at least two witnesses should see the moon and two, and two people who are trustworthy. Um, and once they see it, obviously that would mean the beginning of Ramadan, which means that the night, as we mentioned before, the night comes before the day. The first night of Ramadan would begin. Uh, if you're in a Muslim country, I'm sure they, they have like um, cannons, right? They have any cannons in your country? Yeah. You hear the cannons and now you know that Ramadan is begin, uh, begins. And that in itself, subhanAllah, at least for me, from someone who grew up here, to go to some place and you're seeing all these announcements. Because, you know, whenever I think of cannons, you think of like the 4th of July, you think of other, you think of other issues, and it's kind of amazing to see how uh, uh, how much emphasis on a on a, a large scale Ramadan is, is made. So um, that's the beginning of Ramadan through a moon sighting, right? Um, once you see Ramadan, there are two opinions, and that is that because one of the conditions of fasting is that you have a niyyah to fast, an intention to fast. Some say that you have to make that intention every single day of Ramadan, and some say that you can make it at the beginning of Ramadan. Um, the point here is that a person doesn't wake up after, after uh, uh, Fajr and say that they want to fast, but even if you make, because for example there's a dua that you should say, if you don't know it, you can open uh, um, the fortress of the believer and you can read this dua either in English or in Arabic, in which, in which it tells you the dua you should say when you see the moon, uh, when the first night of Ramadan is, uh, is here, and that you make your niyyah, and, and here, the niyyah, although in here it's a niyyah that's this dua you say, but it doesn't mean that you have to say this dua every single uh, night before, like if you don't say the, this dua before you wake up for Fajr, then you're not allowed, to, or that your fasting doesn't count, it just means that you have in your heart the intention that tomorrow you're going to fast. If you sleep before Fajr, it means that when you wake up, and I say you wake up after Fajr, you had already had before that, uh, before you woke up, that you were going to fast the previous night. So uh, it may be kind of common sense for us, but it's something that we have to have an intention 
uh, to fast that um, the previous night. So the point here, I guess, for us is just to see that dua that we can say before uh, or at the beginning of Ramadan. And then Allah says, أُحِلَّ لَكُمْ لَيْلَةَ الصِّيَامَ رَفَثُوا إِلَى النِّسَائِكُمْ هُنَّ لِبَاسٌ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسٌ لَهُنْ That Allah says, it has been permissible for you the night preceding fasting to go to your wives. Um, they are clothing for you and you are clothing for them. And this was an exemption, uh, something that was made permissible after, after it was impermissible. In the second stage of fasting, the, those who used to, uh, the first stage was that you had the option of paying the, the penalty for not fasting or, or, or having to fast. The second stage was that Allah had made it that if a person went to sleep um, before, or if they went to sleep and they hadn't eaten or they hadn't uh, you know, been able to do everything that was uh, haram for them to do while fasting, then they couldn't do it until the next day. So, and this was a very, very difficult on some of the people of Medina because as farmers, they were extremely, it was extremely difficult for them to fast. Especially if you can imagine somebody, for example, uh, uh, people who had never fasted before, and then now with their, I mean, even for us now, we're looking at a similar situation, that our work days are extremely long. And so you may, after work or after it's time to break fast, you may decide to take a, a nap. So in that time, in the second stage of fasting, that if you took a nap and went to sleep and didn't, that you could not, if you woke up in the middle of the night, they weren't allowed to eat until the next day. They had to continue fasting. So it became difficult, and some of the companions complained to the Prophet that it's too difficult for them uh, to, to do this. And so this ayah was revealed. Um, that it is now permissible for them to uh, um, do everything that was um, impermissible for them to do during while they were fasting, even if they went to sleep, so long as it's before Fajr. Uh, so, then Allah says that, that you should, um, you can eat and drink and do other things up until you can see the white or you can differentiate between a white and black thread. Now it may seem kind of comical, although Allah was being metaphoric, but that some of the companions took this literally. And because they would come out, they would have a white and a black string and they would, uh, you know, be looking until um, until they could d differentiate between those two strings. So, when it got light enough that they could differentiate between those two strings, then they would stop fasting. So, um, the Prophet ﷺ, he initiated or he instituted two adhans. The first adhan was to warn, was to, like even if you go to certain Muslim countries in Ramadan, they still they do this, or they have two adhans. One is before Fajr, and one is the time of Fajr. Maybe like an hour before Fajr, depending on the country. Um, and so the point is that the Prophet ﷺ, he ordered Bilal, radiallahu an, to call the first adhan, which is, like I said, an hour before Fajr. And then um, another companion, Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum, who was the, he was blind, he was the man who came to the Prophet ﷺ, uh, in which the Prophet ﷺ kind of turned away from him, in which we have the Surah Abasa wa Tawalla, that he, he became the Mu'addin for, uh, the, for the, the second event, which was the real time of Fajr. And so this was to allow the companions to know that, okay, they can wake up at the Adhan of Bilal to begin eating, and they have to stop when they heard the second adhan of the second companion. And that's, you know, very, shows a lot of wisdom, especially by having two, you know, by not having the same person give the adhan twice, you can see the, the hikmah of the Prophet ﷺ, because if you were to hear him, you may think, oh, okay, this is the first adhan, I can still, I can get up to start eating. 
but now the companions could differentiate between what time is it. If they heard the first adhan, they heard Bilal of Allah uh, called him the adhan, they know that they still have time to eat. If they heard the adhan of the second companion, Abdullah bin Abim Umm Maktoum, uh, then they would know that, okay, it's time for Fajr, they can't eat. Uh, why would that be important? Because, um, obviously, they know when to begin their fasting and when to end it. But at the same time, uh, there's something else that should be noted, is that if, what do you do if you are in the middle of your food and you hear the adhan for Fajr or the time that you, you know, your clock goes off, your cell phone goes off and says that it's the adhan and you're in the middle of eating or drinking. What happens if you decide to swallow that last spoonful of biryani or handful of fufu or a cup of water? Now, my, I don't mean to be insulting, but what gave you the, the, the knowledge to say that? Is there your own deduction or you have... All right, good. So, you know, in everything that we do, we do, we should try to always have evidence, especially in something as big as fasting, whether or not... You know, subhanAllah, I, there was a time when I was in the university, my first year, I had no idea why, but everyone, all these students, and I, until this day, actually, I have no idea what they heard to give them, and it became like very, very rampant, I, I should say, that people would hear the adhan and be like, oh, it's okay, you can still eat until the end of the adhan. That, so, I mean, and if you're like in, you know, in a Muslim country, you know how they call the adhan, it's like five minutes, so they're like, great, you can still uh, catch your whole meal if, if, you're, if you're, you can eat fast enough. But... Um, the point of the, the hadith says that if a person is eating or drinking and they hear the adhan and they should swallow that last morsel of food or drink uh, um, and that's it. So if it's in your mouth, not at the tip of your, you know, not, you know, right next to you, then if it's in your mouth or you're chewing it or, you know, swallowing it, then you should finish swallowing it. But if not, then you should stop. And so, um, now some even say that only this is only for, for something, only while you're drinking. But the hadith, alhamdulillah, when we go by evidence, then it's safer. I mean, it's, it's permissible. Because I know uh, in some of the, I was reading a book of Rasul al-Fiqh, in which the author was saying that it's only drinking and not eating. Because in order to drink, it's a lot quicker than uh, eating. And that because of the, you know, that split seconds between hearing the adhan and the time of fajr, then um, it's okay, but the hadith clearly says that whoever is eating or drinking and they hear the adhan, they should finish whatever morsel of food or a sip of whatever mouthful of water they have or something they're drinking and then you stop. Um, the other issue is that someone was, one of the companions was asked how much time, because another issue that we have, at least in some Muslim countries, I don't know if in America, I'm sure, uh, it may not be the same, but some people have a habit of eating suhoor very, very early before fajr, maybe like two hours before fajr. I've been in places where they eat, for example, if fajr is at five, they begin eating at two or three, and they stop at like four. And so they begin, and this is something that, although it's permissible, it's, it's somewhat, uh, um, it starts to again, where we begin to combine the, the fasting, uh, the, the, may we elongate the day of fasting to something more than what Allah has uh, prescribed. And this is something that is where it becomes problematic. Although it's, 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 it, will be, it will be considered disliked, makruh, for a person to eat so early to make their, 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 um, their suhoor very early and their iftar very late, the Prophet said that there is barakah in suhoor. So it is from the sunnah to eat before you fast. And not like some of us do, you know, we eat, especially now that Ramadan is going to be late, oh, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, go to bed, so I'm just going to eat a big meal, and then I'll just, you know, uh, wake up for fajr, and I won't eat suhoor as a way of saying that um, uh, you won't have to get up again. And the Prophet said, firstly, that there is barakah in suhoor. And he said that the, this ummah is still, there is barakah in this ummah, 
so long as they delay their suhoor and rush to their iftar meaning that they are very very um, keen on eating to the last minute before Fajr and that they are unlike in some places where they delay you know maybe, maybe even five minutes or even longer after the time of iftar in order for the for the idea of saying that we want to make sure that um, that the fasting that the day is over but the Prophet said that that's not the right way the right way is that you should hurry up to, to, you should delay as much as possible your suhoor, meaning the meal you eat before you fast, and that you should um, rush or expedite your um, eating or your iftar when you break your fast, and that is how we can retain the barakah uh, uh, of the ummah. And so some, one, of the, someone was, the, one of the companions was asked, how many minutes did they um, wait, or how many minutes did they stop eating before Fajr? Because as you as you know, they didn't have you know watches. They didn't have satellite watches where they could have everything synchronized. So um, he said the companion res responded, the, the equivalent of fifty, of 50 ayat. The equivalent of fifty ayat. So some of the scholars say that this is about ten to fifteen minutes. So the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. The, their habit was they would stop eating 15 minutes before Fajr. They would keep on eating until about 15 minutes before Fajr in an effort to stay away from uh, that danger zone where they don't know whether or not it's Fajr. Especially if we get into our, like I remember in Sabineen either a couple of years back, that it's like even though we have four, three or four masajid in very close proximity, each one of them has a different time for Fajr. Some of them are like two minutes apart, some of them are five minutes apart, some of them are even ten minutes apart. So, um, I don't know now, I, didn't, I don't remember from last year what, what, what we did, but, um, you know, it's very important. So you see that it's, it's, it's a good idea to give ourselves, especially when there's so much of a difference of uh, opinion on when to break our, or to begin fasting, because it's difficult to t determine fajr. That's the reality, right? That's why some people may need to, you know, pray or um, stop eating before Fajr because it may be difficult to identify when Fajr begins. But it's very easy on a normal day to identify when Maghrib, <coughs> excuse me, when Maghrib uh, ends or when Maghrib arrives. All you got to do is when the sun sets. There's no difference. It's not too difficult for a person to see the sun is setting. But it may be extremely difficult for a uh, person to see when um, Maghrib is, or when Fajr is, is here. So, um, so that's the point. So the companions used to wait about 10 to 15 minutes before, uh, I mean, eat up until 10 to 15 minutes before Fajr in order to, uh, uh, before they would stop for that night or that morning. Another issue that is common is that if a person wakes up for Fajr and they're in a state that requires them to take a shower, then they don't have to, uh, if they wake up after Fajr, for example, after the time of Fajr has, has already come in, they don't have, they don't, like, they're still allowed to continue fasting. There's nothing to prevent them from fasting if they, they wake up in a state of junub, if you know what that means in Arabic. If you don't, it's simply when you need to take a, a complete shower in order to pray. So, um, if a person, wakes up after the time of Fajr, let's say Fajr is at 5, you wake up at 5.05 and you're still in that state, you just take a shower and pray Fajr. You wouldn't have to say that you can't fast that day because you're in that state. What's that? No, I mean, no, it's only Fajr because after that you'd be fasting. Yeah, you could miss Fajr, but you, uh, if you, okay, you mean like if you overslept Fajr, and you're still in that state, then you wake up and pray Fajr, I mean, take a shower and pray Fajr, but, um,
I'm smiling for another reason, but um, okay. Uh, let me see how to word this. There are a few instances where you have to take a shower. So if you wake up, if you were to stay awake until Fajr, and you're in that state, I don't know how a person could go to sleep and not pray Fajr if they're still awake, but for whatever reason, they, they went to sleep. Then, whenever they wake up, they have to take a shower and pray whatever they missed. Yeah. But if, let's say, a, like a normal situation where a person uh, went to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning and woke up at after Fajr, after, I'm not saying, that when I say after Fajr, I mean Adhan al Fajr. They woke up after the Adhan al Fajr and they're in this state, they're in Junub, then they just take a shower and continue fasting. If they woke up at eight o'clock in the morning, then same thing. They would take fajr. They they would. The difference would be that they would have prayed fajr on time if they woke up after the adhan and fajr, um, but before shuruq, and it wouldn't be any harm to their their fasting. If they overslept, then they would be praying qaba of fajr, and then they would be praying. Um, they would still take a shower. So the, the point here is not necessarily as much as the emphasis on the Salah as much as it is on the Siyam. to Islamic college? Well, the issue is, is, is uh, 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 um, uh, a wajib siyam and a nafil siyam. The Prophet Sallam, he sometimes wouldn't have food in his house. There's a hadith in Bukhari that Aisha radiallahu anha would ask, is, I mean, he would ask Aisha radiallahu anha, is there any food? And he would say no. I mean, she would say no, and he would say, okay, I'm fasting. That's for a nafila, meaning that it's not wajib. He didn't, it, was, it wasn't in, in the month of Ramadan. On a normal day, he didn't have any food. So he said, okay, instead of going hungry for no reason, I'll just say I'm fasting. So the scholars say that on a day that's not Ramadan, you have up until dhuhr, because he would ask her in the morning. On a day outside of Ramadan, you have up until dhuhr to make your niyyah to fast. If you haven't eaten. If you haven't eaten or, you know. So, um, you know, broken, if you haven't broken your fast through one of the normal ways of breaking your fast. But that's outside of Ramadan. If during Ramadan, then, you know, you, you have to make your niyyah, because you can't make your niyyah, you have to, for Ramadan, you have to make your niyyah before Fajr, in order for it to count. Then, yeah, okay, so, so then it's, it's fine. So uh, that circumstance would be only if they, uh, I mean, outside of the month of Ramadan. Tayyib. So um, the Prophet ﷺ, so what do you do if a person breaks their fast in the month of Ramadan? Or let's put it like this way. Everyone knows, okay, you can't eat, you can't drink, right? This is getting longer than I expected. All right. So you can't eat, you can't drink. So what happens? If you go, let's say you're driving someplace, and you see that you think the sun is setting, and you think it's completely set, and you keep driving, I know this happened to me once before when I was driving to Lancaster here actually, that you drive in one area, and you think that the sun is setting, and you drive a little bit further, and you see, oh no, the sun is like fully, fully, um, you still have like four or five minutes before it sets. Meaning that you intentionally broke your fast, before Maghrib, because you thought that Maghrib was here. What do you do? Hazen, what do you do? One what? <laughs> <laughs> Hadawan, how about you? Yeah, we're going to get all of you today. I, is it forgiven? What? 
Alright, good. At least you were. People used to do that to me. Teachers used to do that to me in school all the time, right? I'm like dazing off and they ask me a question I can answer back quickly. So, um, if you intentionally break your fast, intentionally break your fast, because you thought the time was here, but it's not, then you don't have any kafala. The kafala, anybody know what the kafala is? It's pretty harsh. I wouldn't advise you, I wouldn't advise you to take it lightly. Huh? Yeah, what is it? Do you know what it is? If you intentionally break your fast in Ramadan, say, I'm, I can't take it anymore. I work in a warehouse or I'm exhausted. I just, just forget it. I'll fast tomorrow. And you break your fast. It's two consecutive or two continuous months. At your first availability, not when you feel like it. You can't wait until, okay, I'll wait till summer, winter gets here when the days are, you know, nine hours. So uh, you have to fast two consecutive months. If you intentionally break your fast from any means that breaks your fast, yes? Would that be recorded as a major sin or not so big of a sin? Of course it's a major sin. If a, there's the very little other punishment of equivalent to, to fasting two months. Actually, it's one of the penalties of killing someone. Accidentally. Yes, brother? Say you're like not old enough yet to fast like my age, and like you're like really hungry and you can't handle it, is it still like a major sin? No. But how, when do you become an adult? Oh, that's not even that. So, um, anyway, so, yeah, if you are uh, under the age, meaning you're not considered an adult in Islam, and if you don't know what an adult is in Islam, I advise you to ask your parents, and parents, I advise you to teach your children when they become adults, because it's not 18 like in America or 21, that in Islam, if you haven't reached the physical signs of puberty, then by 15, the scholars say that you're an adult. So by most circumstances, our teenagers by what, ninth grade or 10th grade for sure, if they haven't skipped, are adults. Meaning that, what does it mean to be an adult? It means that the Sharia is completely applicable to them. So if you, have, if you wait till they're an adult to start wearing hijab or to start telling them to pray Fajr or to start telling them to, to you know, fast Ramadan, then you're doing them a great disservice because now they haven't had the training or the, the, the time to kind of allow the, the religion to be normal for them and it's probably almost a, is a kind of oppression to just, you know, one shot say, okay, now you got to do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. Or they'll be living their life thinking, well, I'm still a kid, and in reality, Allah is still holding them accountable. So, I know that I went over my 45-minute suggested time. So, um, the last thing I'm going to talk about quickly when it comes to um, uh, two things. The first thing is, just to reiterate, is that if you intentionally fast, I mean break your fast, because you thought the time was, but it's not there, you just have to make it up. You don't have to fast two months, you just have to make it up another day, outside of Ramadan. Uh, there's no kafara, and you just have to, make a, you have to make it up. If you intentionally did it, you already said it's two months. If you forget you're fasting, and you forget that you're fasting, and you indulge in anything in which was impermissible for you to do while fasting, especially when it comes to eating and drinking, the Prophet ﷺ said that um, consider it a gift from Allah. And sometimes, especially, this is probably most prevalent in the beginning of Ramadan, the first few days when you're not used to, uh, you know, I can remember vividly um, in my school, I used to have a water fountain near my, um, my classroom or something at a certain period, I would always drink water. It would always be the first of Ramadan, the first few days I would have to get out of the habit of going to that water fountain. So, um, the point of the matter is that if it's accidental, then you're not um, obligated to, I mean, you don't have to make it up and you just continue fasting. The last thing um, when it comes to Ramadan is that although somewhat of a sensitive topic, I didn't think there'd be that many kids here, but the Prophet Sallam, he used to um, he used to, so some, some people ask, okay, that especially if you're just a person who recently married or newlywed or young couple or whatever or they may ask okay what happens if they uh, um, you know kiss their wife or, or vice versa 
And so Aisha radiallahu anha, and this is one of the benefits of having Aisha as she was considered to be one of the scholars of Islam. And she allowed us to understand the Prophet's life inside his home in which we would never be able to see outside. We would not be able to know how he acted inside of his home. And that he said that, or she quoted saying that he used to uh, kiss his wives while he was fasting and that he was the most, um, he was the most, what's the right word? He was the most protective of his religion than any one of us. So she was alluding or she was going before the, you know, before we would have some type of thought come to our mind. She already put it, let us see that he only, whatever he was doing, it wasn't something that was going into this, you know, uh, danger zone. That if you can, and I'm sure, I don't even know why I'm being so shy about it, because I'm sure you all see it on TV anyway. And even though, I'm going to assume that, that if you watch regular cable, not even cable, regular, you can see amazing stuff that I just think that you should take your TV and throw it in the trash can. But that's just me. Um, that... Someone may say, okay, you may, like maybe see it in these typical TV shows, a person kisses his wife to go to work or kisses when he comes to work, that it doesn't mean anything, there's anything intimate in that action. It's something almost normal. Uh, certain cultures, it's, it's, it's very normal, right? In certain cultures, you may, Mr. Devon, think this is weird, maybe you do it, I don't know, but as soon as you come into the house or your father comes into the house, what might you be expected to do in Afghanistan? Nothing? Let's ask the person who knows. Yeah, Sister, what happens in Afghanistan when your father comes in the house? Do you do anything? All right, I know in, 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 uh, in Yemen, I'll say it in Yemen, when somebody, when their father walks in, all the children kiss their knee, kiss his knee. Some kiss their head, right? Uh, their, head, their father's hand, and some kiss their head. It all depends on what culture you come from, right? And if you don't do it, it will be considered like a really huge, huge uh, uh, insult. All you do is say salam. Yeah, all you do is say salam, and I'm sure you'll, you'll see, inshallah, one day you go to Afghanistan, you'll be like me, right? Your father will never teach you the culture of Afghanistan, and then when you go there, he'll get really angry when you don't do the culture like my dad does whenever I'm around Nigeria, and then I don't do whatever stuff they do, and then I look like, whoa, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here, I have no clue, and... I'm not going to do other stuff. I'm not going to do that. I'm sorry. So you're angry, but it's not my fault. So um, you'll see the culture class. Um, <clears throat> so the point is that it is permissible. Obviously, as long as you think it's going to, or you're, you're not going to go into where it becomes too intimate. So uh, are there any questions about fasting? Yes, Matt, sister. Yeah. Okay, kind of Does that mean that we kind of give them the allowance of doing it half a day or, you know, so that they can intentionally break it before it's time to break it? Before? I haven't really resolved how to say this because from what I notice, I seem to have the opposite effect, which is that as you, I'm sure, know that the Sharia is not applicable to someone who is not an adult when they're not an adult. So they don't have to do anything. Um, but we have to train them so that when they become an adult, it's normal and natural and that there's no issue about it. So obviously, if they fast for a few hours or for a few, maybe some of them are strong enough to say, okay, they fast one day and they don't fast the other day. However, you decide, then you know that's fine as long as it's... The point is to train them and they get rewarded if they do it properly. Um, for that time. Just like the Prophet he commanded us to train, I mean, okay, let's say that the average, maybe a girl may become pu reach puberty around 12, maybe a boy around 14 or 15, that um, at the same time the Prophet said that um, command your children to start praying at 7 and beat them or spank them, however you want to say it, um, at 10. So obviously even the Prophet was saying that give them a, you know, a good enough time to, to, to make this practice a part of their daily life, a part of their daily routine. So definitely it's, it's a good idea to train them 
young. Just as a last note, there's a famous, one of the most famous books of Maliki, Maliki Fiqh. The Fiqh of Imam Malik is called Al Risada. The person who wrote it was uh, a scholar who was a scholar in his own right at around 21. Or some even say he was younger when he wrote the book. Why did he write the book? Because some of his relatives, his cousins, who were, I guess, reaching the age of puberty, as he mentioned in the, the introduction of his book, they were asking about the rules of Islam. And so he wrote this book as a way to uh, um, let them see everything they needed to know before, the, and, he, and he states in the book that he wanted them to know everything they would, ha they would be required to do before they become adults. So it's extremely important how these you know, scholars in the early generations, how they saw how important it was to train your children into making these practices a part of their life and not as many people do where they just, you know, at the moment, they say, okay, all these different things are now, you can't go outside anymore, you can't have these type of friends, you have to do this, you have to do that, where it becomes where they almost become, you know, antagonistic towards the religion because they're not used to it. So, inshallah, I'm sure it's time for a break. Um, and then we'll reconvene, I guess maybe at five, and then try maybe about a half an hour. Shouldn't be that long discussion about i'tikaf and Eid, and then we can conclude the session. So, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, and I'm going to stop for the morning. So, ten minutes, brothers and sisters, and then we'll come back.